Hi, Professor Sills here, and um, my goal is to uh, go over with you the Chapter 8 Air Pressure and Winds questions and uh, maybe give you a few more insights as we uh, take a look at this. So let's look at the questions that were asked. What is considered stand standard sea level atmospheric pressure in millibars and inches of mercury? Well, let's understand first that um, the atmosphere can be thought of as uh, a giant weight that's sitting on the surface of the Earth. So if you are uh, at the surface, which I'm pointing to here uh, in this uh, anticyclone or high pressure system, then you've got a column of air above you that's generating weight or a certain amount of pressure. Pressure is defined as force per unit area, the same way we measure car tires in pounds per square inch. Well, we could do the same thing here at the surface, and the fact is if you held your hand out, your hand is supporting 14.7 pounds of air on every square inch of your hand. Well, that's one way to measure pressure, but uh, in meteorology, we tend to measure it in um, inches of mercury or in uh, millibars, and I'll explain in a second why that came about. But standard sea level pressure is 29.92 inches. Um, anything above that is considered higher pressure. Anything below that is considered lower pressure. Ben Franklin, I believe, was the first or one of the first to develop a barometer and noted that from his observations that at sea level, which is roughly where Philadelphia is, standard sea level pressure is 29.92 inches. Um, anything above it, high pressure, generally associated with fair weather. Anything below it, low pressure, generally associated with stormy weather. Now, why is, why is that? In a high pressure system, the air is sinking. If air is sinking and more air is flowing to this point from above than is flowing out from the point, then pressure will rise. So that is a high pressure scenario. Here, air is rising. And if air is rising faster than air is flowing back into the central point, then what you will be creating is a low pressure area or a partial vacuum. And of course, rising air is generally associated with clouds and precipitation. So that's why we generally associate low pressure or storm systems with stormy weather. Now, um, what about this inches of mercury in millibars? The fact is that in a mercurial barometer, what's a mercurial barometer? Simple. You have a column of mercury that rises up courtesy of the air pressure pressing down on the mercury outside of it. The only requirement is you have to have a vacuum inside, and that's not a very difficult thing to generate. Just fill a column of uh, glass with mercury, invert it, drop it into a mercury dish. Don't do this because mercury is toxic and I don't want you to have mercury in your homes. However, um, what you will find is that the column of mercury will settle out at a height of about 29.92 inches, higher if you're under the effect of high pressure, lower if you're under the influence of a storm system. Now, because mercury barometers are both inconvenient and dangerous, uh, we don't have them in our homes, but what we do have in our homes are aneroid barometers. An aneroid barometer is one where this coil on the inside here will expand or contract because there is a vacuum inside according to what happens to the outside air pressure. As it expands and contracts, it causes the needle to move. Obviously, when under higher pressure, the needle will move in this direction. Under lower pressure, the needle will move in this direction. So going back to the questions, you can see we've addressed number three, uh, number four. Uh, number three, by the way, standard pressure in millibars is uh, uh, 760. And in hectopascals, I believe, is 101.325. <coughs> um, looking at number five, how does sea level pressure differ from station pressure? Can two ever be the same? The answer is yes, if the station is at sea level pressure, is at sea level. On the other hand, if the station, for example, Denver, is several thousand feet above sea level, the air pressure is necessarily lower. Why? Because you're higher in that column of air. If you're situated up here, think about it, you have less air above you. The air above you weighs less. So your normal pressure is going to be significantly lower, maybe 24 inches, 23 inches, as low as 22 inches. Well, it wouldn't do any good if we tried to make a weather map that wasn't standardized to sea level because it would look like there's permanent low pressure over areas like the Rocky Mountains and even over the Appalachian Mountains. So when you take station pressure at a place like Denver, they always adjust it to sea level and that way you end up with a normalized sea level pressure.
Okay. Closely spaced isobars. Let's take a look at this image here. You can see the isobars are packed closely together here and not so closely together over here. For example, you're going from a thousand millibars, which is what this concentric circle represents, to a thousand eight millibars over a several hundred mile distance from the northeastern corner of, if I know my geography, Lake Huron, over to northeastern Pennsylvania. Well, that's a distance of several hundred miles. Well, that's eight millibar change from a thousand to a thousand eight. Over here, that same distance goes from a thousand to a thousand twenty, approximately. So that's a twenty millibar change on this side of the cyclone, and it's an eight millibar change over a similar distance on this side of the cyclone. Basically, what's happening here is since air flows from high pressure back here to low pressure, you have a spiraling of air from the high into the low, and it's doing so rather quickly from here to here. So where the, where the uh, uh, isobars are packed closely together, you have higher wind velocity, and that's, of course, something that uh, we're seeing now in New Jersey and uh, you see periodically during the winter months. Um, let's see. Upper level blow generally from the west. Let's review this again. What you're looking at here is a global atmospheric circulation diagram. This is an idealized diagram demonstrating the Hadley cells that were first theorized back in the 1600s and now we know exist. However, they exist in a modified form from what you see here. Developing this concept again, basically what we have is a region on or near the equator where air is rising. Why? There's intense heating on or near the equator. That rising air can only rise as high as about the tropopause, at which point it must turn poleward. That means as it rises, it begins to move towards the poles here. As it rises, it begins to turn towards the poles here. So when I say it rises and turns poleward, it would be in both locales. At about the 30th parallel, it sinks. When it sinks, some of the air returns to the equator, some of the air turns northward, or I'm sorry, turns towards the, um, towards the North Pole. Let me correct what I just did. You don't want to click there and have it stay blue on us. So, when the air sinks or subsides, it then travels towards the poles or towards the equator. Let's talk about air traveling towards the poles. First of all, where air is sinking, instead of getting clouds and precipitation, it, which is very common along the intertropical convergence zone down here, intertropical convergence zone, air coming together and rising, here along the horse latitudes, so named because that's when the uh, uh, settlers or, or uh, seamen were traveling towards the New World, they had horses on their ships, and so the story goes, they threw the horses overboard because the winds were so light they couldn't travel towards the New World, uh, which is typical of the doldrums or the horse latitudes. You don't have strong winds in between the um, northeasterlies, the, pole, the uh, tropical winds, the tropical trade winds, and in between uh, that and the westerlies. Now, why westerlies? Well, look at this. The air is traveling poleward. Because of the Coriolis effect, as it travels north, it also is shunted to the right. That means it will push to the east. Since the prevailing movement is west to east, all right, once again, west to east, we have the westerlies. So it is because the air is moving poleward that we have the westerlies. Okay, we go back for number 19 to movement within highs and lows. You have sinking air in a high, which because of the Coriolis effect must then spiral out of the high in a clockwise fashion. Rising air within a low, which spirals in because of it, uh, creating a counterclockwise motion. All created by the Coriolis effect. Why? Because these are synoptic scale systems. That means that they are large enough so that a low pressure system will have, um, uh, will have, Put out of that. A low pressure system will have uh, air spiraling into it where it's large enough so that the 
um, winds towards the tropical side of the low pressure system, the lower latitude side, are moving at a different velocity than those up near the poles. Not a concept that you have to really worry about, but it is something worth understanding so that you know what's going on. Okay, um, last questions. Looking at questions for thought. Explain why on a sunny day an aneroid barometer would indicate stormy weather when carried to the top of a hill or a mountain. Well, um, very simple. As you move higher in altitude, the air pressure decreases, so it would appear to be stormy conditions uh, on the barometer, even though what really determines the conditions is whether air is rising or sinking. So just understand that higher altitude produces um, lower air pressure or results in lower air pressure. And lastly, if air were not rotating, if the earth were not rotating, the air wouldn't spin and the wind would blow directly from a high to a low. It would not spiral out of the high and into the low. It would simply travel directly from high to low and that would eliminate any of the Coriolis effect in these synoptic scale systems. So with that, I hope that this has been helpful to you and useful and uh, we, will we will proceed and continue on. Thanks much and you have a great day.